This UCSD TV program is a presentation of University of California Television for educational and non commercial use only. I gave Anthony maybe five or six plays to look at that might have life as a, a, an operatic expression. And I think he zeroed in immediately on Lilith for its myth, its, uh, its uh, uh, musical potential for arias and for conflict, and that it was a uh, under-publicized myth in, in at least Western society. Uh, and the feminism of Lilith, which is a, an exciting issue with Lilith Fair and how in the si late 60s many women's groups seized on Lilith as a, um, an exciting icon that needed rehabilitation. It, it was amazing because it had combined all those things also with the wicked sense of humor. And I, I'm drawn to humor. Um, I think that something that opera has lost a lot of, you know, and in, in, in particularly in modern opera, you know, that, that you know, when uh, we're, we're too worried about being serious and we can't be funny. And I, I love, so I love the, the balance between this really serious examination of what, of what, uh, what modern day woman is, what a woman is, and what Lilith represents. At the same time, the comic aspect of it, I think, is, is necessary. You know, it makes it, to me, much more real and much more dangerous, too. So that's, that was exciting. I was very interested in the, in this and the the, the the kind of the compel the story behind it and the idea of uh, re-examining the roots of our you know our religion. Most people think of Adam and Eve and the Garden of Eden and not something preceding it, and it's kind of disturbing a lot of. I mean, even you know what we think of the uh, the Book of Genesis, et cetera. So so I, so I was excited about that and uh, how it related to the modern times, how it related to today. The kind of fatal at attraction aspect of the story intrigued me too, because I wanted to to root it back into uh, something today. You know, the, how it, how it could reflect on today. Lilith is essentially not a biblical character. She's a character in midrash interpretations of the Bible. She's a character in lore. She's a character in stories. So she doesn't really disappear. And of course, she's not unique to Judaism. Raphael Patai's book, The Hebrew Goddess, points out um, that we could see Lilith as an archetype, a kind of Jungian creation of many religions that expresses essentially erotic power and the dangers of female erotic power. Lilith is a very dangerous uh, um, archetype. And I think what the opera and, and perhaps what the play is stating is that Eve and Lilith can look at each other in the mirror, that they are really one identity that have to deal with attention in, in modern life as well as in biblical times. That's what's really fascinating about Alan Havis' opera is the notion that Eve and Lilith are two parts of a good woman. Eve representing marriage, God, motherhood. All could be conceived as good things. Lilith representing a woman's power separate from a man, a woman's desire and right for sexual pleasure, a woman as a single mother in a certain kind of very bizarre way. And I think that um, what Havis's play is also about is that it's our task to take the good out of Lilith. Restoring Lilith is part of, um, again, integrating Eve and Lilith. Eve is all compromise. Lilith is no compromise. What you need is fiery, fiery independence and then compromise, you know, laced together. 
and 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 we don't that that's hard it's you know that's very difficult how do you survive if you are 100% low earth I knew I had to simplify the amount of language presented. It was not a, a discussion play. It was really uh, sung music with a little bit of um, conversation that could happen. But uh, the first concern was how much rhyme scheme I had to use. And uh, uh, Anthony was clear about I, I could play with some rhyme scheme, but I didn't have to feel straitjacketed by you know, rhyming couplets and that uh, a lot of blank verse can happen. But it allowed me also then to deal with more poetic structure that, that was not part of realism. And that's what I love about the libretto because, um, and I think the directness of the libretto, and I, I find it, it breaks through a lot, of, a lot of barriers because it becomes almost what I would call the hyper-real. When, when something becomes, I mean, like the Sopranos in a way are hyper-real too. I mean, it, with the thing, when, when it, I mean, you actually people would not necessarily talk like that in you know, everyday speech, but it's taking the, the, the base emotion of behind language and, and, and laying it bare. So, you, so, you, so it's like the, the character sort of naked on stage saying what they really feel. Does this Eve take the upper or lower position? You take a missionary. Is she sexy? As sexy as Lilith. She has a vagina, Adam. <laughs> And as the music is mercurial, it, it can change idiom. The language sometimes is lyrical and of a more um, a archaic time, and then it gets very vernacular in the contemporary. You have to have the right people. I mean, that's what it comes down to. I mean, people were really devoted to the project, and really, we, I mean, the cast was incredible. I mean, Cindy and Susan and Phil were all, uh, and Ruff, all rose to the occasion. They worked very hard. love the character because I think she's incredibly smart and incredibly strong and um, and she kind of acts the way I do when, when people don't want <laughs> when people hurt my feelings I mean she basically you know reacts to all the all the bad things she does is in reaction to how people have hurt her <laughs> to the Aria at the end of the third scene, the, these aren't mere arms, these are wings. Um, I just think it's the most beautiful music. Um, and it kind of 
the most the, the emotional power of the of the character and 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 the depth of the character come through that music and those words and I knew that my husband wrote it for me get inside it I have to know it and so I work on the, the melody and the rhythm and try to get all of that in my ear and in my my um, so that I don't have to think about it as much and it's it's there and so that the character can kind of live through that can come through um, those words and that rhythm you know and then what I get back from the other artists also helps me. Um, Ruff gave me so much to play off. I love a challenge and I love to take risks as an, as an artist. I thought the music was brilliant. I think Anthony is a genius, the way he arranges the harmonic, the harmonics in his music and are just gorgeous. And um, I was drawn to the myth. The myth is incredible. It's a wonderful, powerful myth that's I don't think used enough because it's a you know woman-centric myth. It's a, power to women, it's a feminist myth. And so I was drawn to that too. I, I do a lot of things for my living. I'm, I make my living in the theater, so I'm an actor, I'm a director, playwright, composer, um, producer. So I do a lot of things, like Alan Havis. We both do a lot of different things. And, um, but as an actor, I'm a physical actor. I was trained in physical methods. Um, and so I work from the outside in. And uh, I try to find my character's physicality how they relate to the environment around them, and then dig in deeper and continue to dig in deeper. biggest challenge was the rhythm for me. Tony likes to write um, over the bar and with a lot of groove and sometimes you don't know where the groove, where the one is so you really need that. Con with the conductor, Alan made it so much easier. You do a pits there and then do a do arco because um, it kind of comes And Alan Johnson, who's a music director, is unbelievably gifted at putting together things. Very talented conductor, but not just that, but has a sense of what, what's going on in the drama, has a, oh, a sense of the overall shape of a piece that most conductors wouldn't have. The challenges as a chief interpreter are to, um, well, to ultimately get to a place where you, I, I am uh, uh, 
um, guiding the orchestra and guiding the singers and basically being the driver of the bus <laughs> while everybody else has this, while there's this drama going on behind me. And I'm just driving it securely and making sure that it can all happen. Letting, letting the singers who are very well trained in, um, to do what they do best, allow the musicians to do what they do best and let the story be told, to breathe with it, allow it to happen, not to make it rush or slow down, and, um, but ultimately to get to the place where the story is told. audience should not be aware of, of what's going on. They should be able to hear music, hear very interesting music, rhythmically propelling music, harmonically interesting music, and to just focus in on what someone is saying and what, what is the response from the next person. How does that person react to what someone has just said so that we, you, you lose track of, of time and we just we get involved in a drama. And it's a musical drama. It is unusual for a composer to allow something that is generated in a rehearsal that wasn't a part of what he had originally imagined to become a part of, of the piece. And with Anthony, that's because of his background as a jazz composer and a jazz musician and, and improviser. After George Gershwin and what he accomplished with Porgy and Bess and his music theater work, um, Anthony is just, you know, he's, he's this towering figure after, after Gershwin in terms of innovation of bringing improvisation and, and jazz and tying it to the tradition of, of Western opera. really smart, I mean, to have an ensemble of people that you know and trust, I mean, it's the Ellington recipe. You know, you write for these individuals and then, you know, it gives your music a stamp. Technically, it was quite challenging too and very exposed and uh, it was a great challenge. I mean, it was a beautiful piece of music. I really, really, it was very engaging. I think the piano part and my part were non-stop. His sense of rhythm was really, really amazing. It was just, you'd have like five, four measures connected to two, you know, two, four measures, and then like triplets crossing the bars in between those, you know, and yeah. I worked very, very hard on the score, and uh, it took a while, but, but, I, but I got it in the end, and it, it worked out really well. It's, it's a really, really incredible writing. Like, it's just genius, to be honest, and it's uh, just, the whole thing, it was, it was a whole experience for me that was completely new. I, I you know, after, after coming out of that, I feel like I'm a better sight reader, I'm a better player in general, you know.
specific uh, uh, chart or uh, music uh, for drums. I was following uh, most of the time the bass, the bass chart, and I was making my own uh, as, he, as he goes along. Um, he, he kind of uh, trust me somehow in, in a way I wanted to, to approach uh, the drums itself to the music. So, so he just gave me plenty of room. I will say, you know, for my imagination to actually collaborate and, and bring my ideas from the performer perspective. <laughs> It's a, it's a very interesting fact to apply drum set, like trap set, uh, which is, you know, uh, into an opera. And to have the possibility uh, and the, the chance that, that Anthony gave me of, of kind of go on with my imagination and put it up, you know, in the music, it means a lot because it's like uh, having a free talk uh, on top of a subject. Uh, that that is it, it is his subject, but but I'm I'm free to speak uh, about it uh, as much as I, I I I would like to. This is a signature of his that he's always involved improvise improvisers in his ensemble. So, you know, he gave me a lot of, you know, I think all but one of the cadenzas I was involved with. You know, so again that that's. And from 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 the beat from X onwards, there's always been some improvisation in in the parts, not for everyone, but for for the for certain soloists. In effect, we're all improvisers. Improvisation is the middle ground of all the arts. That's something that which the medi mediates every art form, whether you're a visual artist, you know, whether you're a musician, whether you're a playwright, all the, and there's some middle ground that we have where we, where we, where we, do, we make it up. And, and that keeps it fresh, otherwise it, it arrives in the can. Yeah. Composition is not the art. That's not the thing. The performance is the art. Another woman. You're trying to create a situation in which art can happen. Four. You're creating the, creating the occasion for art to happen. And we never should presume that what's written on paper is the art, because what's written on paper just sets up the possibility for the art. This piece works well in, in many respects as a concert because of the density of the language and the conversation. I think it, it lends itself, it, I think it works well. It get, there's a lot to think about just with the words and the music. You don't have to deal with the literalness of the costume being, now we're in the Garden of Eden, now we're wearing uh, uh, Nicole Miller gowns. It, exactly. It, it, it can be more open. Thank you. 
wants mirrors in the bedroom. A bad idea. You've got to give it back. Give it back. You've got to give back his semen. There's a, a great tradition of the dangerous woman that is outside the law and can have free license to say, I want this, I don't care what the, uh, the stakes are. And I think that's the seduction of Lilith. She's not only sexy, but she can say the most outrageous things. She's because she's uncensored. There's nothing, nothing inhibited. There's not, no, no filter. And the opera is saying, what happens when Eve becomes Lilith? How dangerous is that? When she has to become Lilith to save what she feels is vital in her life. So that, that's another paradox for women to look at. If, if they can see their Lilith inside themselves as mother or as wife, and they could perhaps defend the family with a, a, a death blow or you know, a, a, a definitive action that is almost illegal. How do you put a moral value on Lilith? Is she a wrong woman? Um, can she have children? She, her children were taken away in the Garden of Eden. And can she make a compact with Eve? We hope all the husbands will forgive us when they watch the opera, that we, we're rooting for both husbands and wives.